Good afternoon. My name is Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Road. I'm here with my guest, Bill Gurney, co-superintendent of SAU 29. Nice to be here. Thank you. And for I don't know how many people saw last week's show, today is my second show since I've been back from around the country. 13,542 miles. <laughs> <clears throat> so in July, I went one way. In July, you went the other way? Exactly. We probably crossed somewhere <laughs> over the Canadian border. So we kind of looking, you went to China. Yes, sir. I went out west. Yep. So really, the equi we went the equivalent of around the world. We did enough uh, miles absolutely. to go ar around yeah. the world. And um, <clears throat> so I know you've had to enjoy it. Yep. And so what I'm going to do, this is a little bit different, is I'm going to do about a, a six-minute clip mm -hmm. of a number of the pictures that I took around the country. They're incredible. Uh, <clears throat> and... And I want to talk to you a, as an educator yep. about the importance of taking children out into the, to the real world, how you, can, how you can learn in the real world, reinforce mm -hmm. what you hear and learn in, in the classroom. That sounds great. And I think on, on some of them, one of those we were talking earlier, the, um, a picture of Canada when you're going to see the lake and the yep. water is going to be unbelievably blue, like an aqua turquoise blue. And you're saying, well, the reflection of the sun, but talking to the people up there, that usually only happens in the spring when you have the runoff from the mm -hmm. glaciers and the volcanoes. And that's the only p part of the light spectrum that can't be absorbed. Yep. So that is actually the blue being reflected back by glacier and volcanic ash. Yeah. How many of the kids understand glaciers? Most of them are disappearing. Yep. And so, okay, so we're going to roll the clip. We'll come back. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about your trip, and then we'll talk about school. Sounds great. Okay.
So I'll pick on you. The last two pitches. Yep. You have any idea who's that? Well, I knew it was a cabin, and I knew it looked like a remote area. But that's the best I can do. Uh, But I've got a, I think I got a hint from our conversation last week. And is that something that was on the Lewis and Clark Trail? That's where Lewis and Clark um, spent the winter. Really? That was Lewis and Clark's um, room. Yeah. That's where he had his maps, and he was extremely detailed. Every yep. single day they would write His things. journals are incredible. <clears throat> and so, yeah, they would go out. That's pretty close to the Oregon yep. coast. Yep. And basically they went it over, and he <clears throat> they put a little fort. And um, when you look at it, the fort, would take about the size, the footprint of um, 34 West Street. Yep. And um, <clears throat> and another part about it, which I learned, Lewis, I think it's no clock. I think it's clock. Had a slave. Yep. And <clears throat> but he also taught the slave to read and write, mm-hmm. which was against the law. Yep. He also armed the slave, and. There was a number of occasions where the slave was allowed to vote to yep. decide what decisions within the group, d- decisions yeah. within the group. So if you go from history and I go and say, "Hey, Lewis and I mean, Mr. Clark, Captain Clark had a slave," yep, and it's like you would think, well, he was just like <clears throat> everyone else, a slave owner. Yep. But when you realize the difference, what the slave mm-hmm. cope did, and how we he got to vote. He was yep. allowed to hunt. He was allowed to go certain places on his own. He trusted him as a regular one. Yep. And so it'd be kind of like in, in that time frame, the black guy couldn't be on his own. Right. But he had all the privileges of being on his own. Yep. And so, and it was just a number of other things where that one where <clears throat> there was, you could see where there was an earthquake. Yes. And everything was pushed directly right up. Mm-hmm. Then um, you have another one that had maybe 15 or 20 different levels. Yep. Some of our students understand that the middle of the United States used to be an ocean. Yep. And so every single one of those layers as the ocean changed. And so well, that's enough for the United States. <laughs> let's, let's hear about China. China was an incredible experience. I'd been there twice <laughs> before as a guest of the college board um, as we began to organize our uh, Mandarin program at Keene High School. This time we were sending students over. Uh, So 14 students from Joe Ling's class went over the week after school got out and uh, resided in in, uh, Changsha for about two and a half weeks. They took classes at South Yali School during the day and then spent the evenings with uh, host families who were uh, comprised of uh, families that had students going to either South Yali or Nanya School. And uh, they had an incredible experience, Um, you know, ate the foods that the average Chinese person eats, uh, dealt with the pollution and the traffic (laughs) and all the challenges of being in a foreign country. Um, They had one advantage over a lot of Americans in that they were able to uh, speak Mandarin to one extent or another. Some were second year students and they had a, a more enriching experience with their host families because they, of that second year of Mandarin training. And then some were one semester out and uh, so it turned out that they had a function in that society using you know using the native language. It's kind of <clears throat> when I went to school I took well I took a year of Latin which is yep. really a waste. <laughs> <laughs> Taught me how to spell but yeah. but I took two years of Spanish and didn't think nothing of it. Then I go down to Panama yep. had to get stationed on there for six months. In a matter of a couple of days looking at the signs and saying this mm-hmm. and then oh yeah store yep. and you put them together it and all it all starts to flow it starts to flow and i yep. think i've learned more in about six my first six weeks actually being emerged yep. than i did in the two years so i'm pretty sure that helped the, the kids i think so too <coughs> and then uh we picked up meredith cargill and i went over and we would have serve as the <coughs> chaperones for the second part of the journey and Joe Ling uh, came with us uh, and did most of the organizational work and interpreted for all of us. <laughs> uh, and we went from uh, Changsha to Hangzhou, which is the capital of the silk and tea trades um, over the centuries. And then Marco Polo, Marco and, Polo and went there and we visited, uh, saw how the silk was originally made and uh, how the uh, tea is grown. 
And then from there, we made a couple of diversions to small kind of demonstration villages from Ming and Song dynasties, and then on to Shanghai, uh, which was an incredible experience for the students. We came into sh uh, Shanghai about 10 o'clock at night, and we went from being in the countryside <laughs> to the brightest evening skyline <laughs> I've ever seen. And it was just awe-inspiring for all of us. And we walked along the river, uh, saw the lights, and saw the 110-story building, and uh, these incredible buildings where the sides are really television screens at night, advertising products and giving weather forecasts. And we spent about a, uh, the next day uh, seeing a little more of Shanghai, and then headed up to Beijing, uh, where we spent uh, three days touring the capital. Uh, and then on back to Changsha, uh, to, uh, to regroup, say goodbye to the host families, thank the administrators of South Yali, and then on to Hong Kong to fly home. Uh, one of the, the neatest experiences that uh, we all had was that we're tr in order to save some money on the trip, we decided to travel by night on the trains. So we were in uh, these compartments in the, in the trains uh, where 60 people uh, are lined up in bunks three high, and there was no English being spoken, <laughs> And so we uh, we were in those in these ca in these trains with uh, with with regular Chinese people, not the uh, supersonic trains or whatever. <laughs> and uh, for the for the kids who were able to communicate, um, you know, with the folks on the train, it was an incredible experience to see uh, to see another uh, a level of the Chinese society uh, that uh, that you know the average tourist wouldn't get to see. And, and so sorry. Oh, no your kids are just like me, traveling around the country, yes. know, pinching your pennies. Oh, yeah. I had five, three five-gallon gas cans, and I, yep. oh, 334, so I'm going to fill them up because I know yep. it could be 30 cents a gallon more down the road. Yeah, and we also stayed in hotels that were designed and run for Chinese people rather than for tourists. <laughs> uh, so we were in with a lot of school groups that were traveling around China and also with uh, businessmen and um, and and. and uh, those kinds of folks, so that we got a taste again of life in China that uh, you know the average tourist doesn't see, and and the kids were great. It was hard, you know, 19 hours on a train and get up, put your bags down in a in a hotel, and then go out and sightsee for 12 hours. It's pretty demanding, and uh, the kids' spirit never flagged, and uh, and and they got a lot out of it. It was it was a great experience. I'd love to go back with them. They're gonna, but they're gonna remember it yes. for the rest of their lives. They're not going to forget. They're not going to remember how hot it was. Right. And kids, when they're challenged, what is time? They're yep. just going to go. When you were talking, well, first, when you're talking about the different places. Yes. So, <clears throat> China's a pretty big country. It's huge. And I think it's about the third largest. Yes, and in, in sur <clears throat> and surface area. Yeah. Yeah. And um, people forget that when you take China and India and Indonesia, which is just three little countries. Yep. That's one out of every um, three people in the world. That's right. <laughs> and <clears throat> which China is about population is about four and a half times larger than the United States. Yeah, it's about 1.3 billion. And the other part about China, <clears throat> because we talked about the Ming Dynasty and the Hung Dynasty, China is maybe 50, 60, 70 different cultures, different languages. Yes. And there, uh, <coughs> it's it's you can it's it's easier to understand that the regional basis based on the provinces. Uh, so that Henan province, where Changsha is, and the schools, um, they're known for tombs that go back several thousand years, um, that are precursors of the Egyptian tombs or the ones that they found in Central America, and uh, the quality of the products and the craftsmanship that came out of those tombs you know, rivals anything that I've seen uh, from, from Egyptian tombs or, or anywhere else. The quality of the silversmith, silversmithing and the brass work just takes your breath away. Because <clears throat> when you talk about the United States, even when you go back to the 1609 mm -hmm. with Jamestown, or 1607, yep. <clears throat> go to James, that's only 400 years. China is four or 5,000 years. They, they take the <laughs> long view. <laughs> they take the, the long view. And again, when I went to, because some people have said that the Chinese may have been the first ones to come to 
the Americans. There's, there's reason to believe that based on the, uh, the ships there that are called junks, which is a different term <laughs> over there than here. Uh, and I saw some of those ships, and they look as seaworthy as anything that Europeans came over uh, to the United States on in the early 1600s. Because I had gone to Newfoundland about three years yeah. ago. When you look at those Viking ships, yes. they're not very big. No. If you've got 20 people in, you're not, no one's sleeping laying down. Yeah. And <clears throat> when, I, when I went to Panama, and part of it is strange, I remember going into <clears throat> a store. Yeah. And I'd been stationed in Southern California. And then all of a sudden, it kind of just blank. There was a Chinese guy. Yep. And he was speaking perfect Spanish. And it was, my mind says, no, you, you're Chinese. You're not supposed yep. to be speaking <laughs> Spanish. I, was, I, yeah. you know, I thought it was going to be broken English. But when you go down to Panama, Colombia, mm -hmm. Peru, there's a, a lot of Chinese there. All that western coast <clears throat> of Central and South America has a Chinese influence. Because I know Peru, about 15 years ago, the president yep. was either Chinese a Japanese, the one that yep. got thrown out. <clears throat> and so, to get back on the other, we talk, what did the kids get to go see as far as the, the cultural, did they go to the Great Wall of China? Yes, they did. Of course, <laughs> we, did, we did do that. Um, the, to start with, most of the, when they got there to Changsha, uh, most of the families took it upon themselves to, uh, to take the, the students to, to a cultural area of Changsha. So some went to see the, those uh, uh, pyramids, and others went to the uh, provincial museum, and uh, we got they got a chance to really get a sense of pride that people in Hunan province have for for their area. Um, and then as we traveled along, we got to Hangzhou. Uh, that, that was one of the most beautiful cities in, in China, and we started by going to West Lake, which is which is an immense lake uh, that was dug by hand. Uh, an emperor decided that he wanted to have a lake <laughs> and uh, that Digger rivaled died. any other lake in China. And so millions <clears throat> of, of Chinese people went and dug, and many of them lost their lives, uh, building that lake. And you can tra it takes a, in a, about two hours to travel around, even just a section <laughs> of it. So that was pretty awe-inspiring for the, for the kids to understand what, you know, what the human mind can, can envision and, and develop and engineer but also the backbreaking work that was required to bring about one man's vision. And I think something that struck home with the kids in many places was that they were living in a, in a, in a society where one person <coughs> held ultimate authority, whether, whether they were three years old or 70 <laughs> years old, and that what that person said went for the entire, for the entire yeah. country. And coming from a democratic <coughs> society, uh, it takes a while for students to get their head around that concept that one person has that much authority within a group. So we got to see the, uh, you know, the development of the, China, of the silk trade, how the silk trade branched out from Hangzhou into, uh, into, the, into Central Asia and on into Europe, <coughs> how that affected the European economies, uh, which is not that much different from what's, what's happened with ours and, and, uh, and the Chinese economy. And then we, uh, moving on to Shanghai, the sense of not so, uh, Shanghai 100 years ago was basically a mud flat town uh, that was uh, access on into travel to go on up into Hangzhou. And now it's probably the most cosmopolitan and economic based city in the world. And so, how many McMansions did you get to see? What, what's the not size of Chinese house? <laughs> well, the, uh, the average size is smaller than, than our home. Um, usually, the the in the when the houses that are host that were hosting our students probably were um, a living room, uh, a terrace, a uh, a washroom for you know the washing machine and that that sort of thing, a bathroom, uh, a smallish kitchen, more of a galley type of thing, you know, where they they cook, and then two or three bedrooms depending. And often the our kids found themselves uh, in a bedroom with one of the younger kids. Because there wasn't, you know, as many of our <coughs> homes have a guest room, um, they uh, they're much used, more used to being together. What about the family relationship? Well, that was a, a great topic of discussion at several of our dinners. That it's every night the family sits down to dinner, and uh, and it's generally cooked by the grandparents because both parents are working. 
uh, but that it's a, it's, a, it's a more ritualized event than, than what we're having. And for some of the kids on the trip, uh, because of parent schedules, there, there are all, often home meals uh, where the entire family sits down together. And so commenting on how that kept the family together and the sharing of experiences, uh, they felt was a very positive part of, of the Chinese society. And here's the, the one little bit with, with China. China is kind of basically um, a controlled capitalist type system. Yes, central planning. Central <coughs> planning. Yep. But China now, everyone's not poor. You have some really wealthy people as right. a result of capitalism. And you have, uh, you have as, as we've had seen in, in South America and Central America, and we've seen some of it here in the United mm -hmm. States, with the shrinking of the middle class, uh, you tend to get extremes. And China is a good example of that. Uh, you have a very wealthy uh, group of people at, at the top of the economic pyramid, and they're often in connected politically in with government officials, uh, not in a bad way, but in a, yeah. in a positive way. Uh, and then you have uh, a, a very small but growing middle class, and then you have the vast majority of people who, uh, who are either uh, what they call migrant workers, who are construction workers in our society, uh, but have no real attachment either to the land or to uh, long-term education. It was only in the last two years that the children of migrant workers or construction workers uh, were given the uh, right to education. So their, their entry into society was blocked um, up until two years ago. And still, you know, construction projects they, you don't last one, long in one place, uh, but now those kids have an opportunity to go to school. And like here, uh, if you want to move up in society or to be sure that your children at least stay in society where you are, um, the emphasis is education. It, the exams to get into college are highly competitive, and uh, they're really based more around rote than, than our uh, standardized tests, so that the kids have to have that knowledge when they go in to take the test. Creativity is not a, a highly prized uh, attribute there, at, at least at this point. So it comes down to what you score on that test is where you're going to go to college. And if you don't get into any of those colleges, you're, you really are in a, in a quandary to move forward. And the other thing that China does, you, it doesn't matter where you come from, if you pass the test, you're basically in. That's primarily true. The only catch to that would be that um, if, you, uh, if you went to a certain school uh, to prepare for college, you probably have a better chance of your children going there. Um, and that uh, a lot of it goes down into preschool and those early schooling years because there's an exam to get into the uh, high school or, or prep school that, that we would be looking at. So at every step of the way, uh, there are gatekeepers. Yes. And, uh, and, you, and it's really not, there's some influence that a, a family might be able to exert, but primarily it's the merit of that child and their willingness to work hard that's going to make the difference for them. It's a little bit the other, <coughs> excuse me, the other way in the United States, if you can get your kid into Philip Exeter Academy, yes. you've got the money, there's a really good chance no matter what kind of grades your kid get, they can go to an Ivy League school. They have a better. They have a better chance. Yes. <clears throat> and so, pot with China. So it's really competitive. Yep. But China also rewards if you're really good and you graduate. Yep. China will reward its best full boat to Southern Cal, Stanford, yep. those other American um, universities. And uh, there are also more and more opportunities. <coughs> Uh, around the United States for uh, Chinese nationals to come and study. And uh, many of our independent schools ar around the United States have a, a growing percentage of, of Chinese students because the parents feel that uh, whether they go on to college in the United States or they return home and go to college, uh, being fluent in English is a huge advantage for them as, as they move forward in society. That's what Great Britain used to do when mm -hmm. it was at its height of its empire, it's t educating the kids, sending them over to yep. learn that second and third language and, and learn the cultures. And 
So we at the high school are starting to do that. Well, we, have a, we, we realize the importance of it. Um, financially, it's difficult to implement uh, world language programs the way the Chinese have been able to do. Uh, most of the kindergarten students in, in China are getting some form of English language instruction. And uh, we haven't been able to, uh, to work. We have a plan to do a world language program called FLES, Foreign Language um, mm -hmm. Study. And we, we're still working to, to work that into our budget. But the South Yali School, where our students uh, went to visit, there were 26 uh, faculty members in the English department. And uh, so the <laughs> emphasis that they're putting on learning our language and culture is huge. And uh, we, uh, if we're going to stay competitive, we need to be able to understand their culture and language as well. And so it sounds like in the United States, we're educating our children and uh, young adults to get an education. Right where China is educating them not only to get an education, but to be highly successful in the world market. Right, and uh, what they're looking to <coughs> us to help with is uh, how, do we how do we encourage creativity in our students? And how do we get them to think for themselves and problem solve? Uh, most Chinese uh, high school students are, are incredible at reading something and retaining it. Uh, but when they're given complex problems to solve, they don't have those skills to work in a group together to do it or to be able to see a problem and fix it on, the, on their own. Uh, in talking with Chinese educators, they feel that a blending of our two systems would be the <coughs> most ideal educational system where kids are, are getting that rote and more disciplined education, but also are learning the problem-solving skills that uh, make us more successful in uh, the world economy in terms of introducing new products. And Chinese want to get to that point, too. They found that they've gone as far as they can copying uh, <laughs> other people's ideas, and they do it extremely well. Uh, but for them to become innovators in the world, uh, they need to alter their educational system to produce those kinds of talent, talented kids that we have. Uh, we do a very good job of educating. It's kind of like they want to go back to the early part of the British colonies and the early part of the United States where <clears throat> we had kids that we made sure they were engineers mm -hmm. but Harvard and Yale and Dartmouth and Penn also taught liberal arts right. and nowadays you we have a problem how can you be an engineer and be liberal arts yeah. there's two different things but the engineer is is pretty structured and they really don't think out of the box right. and so now it's kind of like you know what, we need to come up with a better way. Yep. We need to be able to save money. We need to be more efficient. So you want to take that liberal arts thinker and combine them. That's right. That sounds like the Chinese and, and are they, looking at And, and they, re they came, a realization <coughs> for those that hadn't realized that was with their high-speed train system. Um, they, they built in redundancies for safety, but they thought in a, in a linear line of what can, ha what can go wrong with a system like that. And that was the result of the, the accident that they yeah. had, that they didn't anticipate one train coming up behind the other the way that one did. When a train went dead on the track, um, if it stopped corresponding its position. And so the train coming behind didn't, uh, they had no time to react at 300 kilometers an hour. Um, we learned that in the 1800s. Yes. And so uh, I think that you know, they're going to get there with that kind of engineering. And hopefully it'll spur our schools to encourage more of our students to go into engineering and, and, uh, and manufacturing and prepare us to be uh, in competition with them. We've, I was just reading uh, yesterday that the United States is now the largest uh, exporter of goods to China, uh, that we've surpassed all of our, our other economic rivals. Uh, and uh, I see that as a great sign that uh, our products are, are wanted and desired um, by Chinese uh, people as well. So there's going to be a lot more of this give and take. I'll put you on a hot spot. Okay. New Hampshire. Yep. Maine. A lot of French people. People go back. They worked at the mills. They did yep. the logging. They worked up in Berlin. Well, what about the French language? There's got to be people who are complaining that French is kind of like a dying language in the schools. Uh huh. Well, ours, our enrollment is up in French. 
Uh, we, uh, from the beginning, I went in and met with the uh, Foreign Language Department, the World Language Department at Keen High. And, you know, the question came up, is Chinese going to replace other languages? And our goal at that time was to strengthen the, depa the department, not to look at saying, well, X number of kids are going to take Chinese so we can, we can eliminate a section of French or, or Latin. Uh, you know, some of that is driven by student enrollment, but we see the importance of being able to communicate with everyone. And that's part, <clears throat> part with culture. You can go, you look at the Keene area. There's yeah. not very many Spanish speakers. And sometimes if you go too much yeah. into Spanish, people think you're infringing on their culture. Yeah. There's not too many Chinese people. But my mother and father-in-law still speak French in the house, yeah. especially when they don't want us to understand what they're saying. <laughs> and in the state house, there's 20 or 30 people that speak French. We get yeah. a guy from Haiti. We get a lot of people from the North Country come down and yeah. speak French. And sometimes they get just a little bit paranoid at kind of like, you're trying to wipe me out. Well, they have a proud history in, in New Hampshire and in Massachusetts. <coughs> the folks that came down and, and took those manufacturing jobs, often very young in mm. life, and, and stayed here and built a family mm. and a career, uh, they have a lot to be proud of. And uh, we need to reflect that in our studies, regional history studies, and celebrate that through the culture and continuing to keep the language going. Okay, now that we've gone around the world, we'll just bring it back to Keene. Okay. We were talking about the SAU building yep. today. Well, I, I usually, when I come on the show, I have a tie on. <laughs> uh, but today we're moving boxes. We've had a very successful move uh, from uh, West Street over to uh, the new yep. SAU building, which I believe 197 Maple. And uh, people are feeling their way around. There's still hundreds of boxes to unpack. Uh, if folks have been trying to get in touch with us, the phone switched over Friday, um, and so uh, we're 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 answering calls and five or six days of emails to get to get rolling. But we uh, Friday afternoon at four, we got the okay for occupancy today, and uh, and things are going well. There's a few minor, we need data drops in certain places where it didn't show on the plans, but I'd say we're 95 percent to where we want to be, and mm -hmm. uh, and the overall the morale is great. Yeah. When I was on the school board before, yep. one of the most contentious thing was sell or keep 34 West yes. Street. It was a, a money pit. Yep. And so can you give people a little background how we got 34 West Street? Sure. Back um, in 1901, I believe it was, uh, 34 West Street was built as the uh, United States Post Office for Keene and was mm -hmm. one story and then a catwalk around the second floor where a lot of the administrative mm -hmm. offices are now. It was an incredible building for the time. Uh, the walls have to be a foot or a foot and a half thick, a solid granite. Nothing's going to happen to that building. And, uh, but there are certain inefficiencies in a building that was built then. Uh, the United States government recognized that back in the 70s and built a new post office here in Keene, uh, closer to Keene State College, and sold the building for a dollar to the Keene School District provided we maintain it and use it for 31 years. And about the, t about the time you were on the school board before, that time expired, which that meant that we were free to sell the building uh, to, to another buyer, or at the time, if, if the board had felt and the public, refurbish it. Um, the decision was made to, uh, to look for offices elsewhere, and I formed a small committee and we searched around the Keene area for, uh, for new SAU offices. We went as far as Winchester and looked at um, a, uh, a seminary down there. Uh, we went as far east as Marlboro. And I remember almost Central Square was, yes. was looked at. And Center of Keene. Uh, we designed our plans for the Center of Keene. And uh, at that point, the uh, negotiations for that space uh, didn't go as far as we had hoped. And uh, the decision was made for us to stay at 34 West Street for the time mm -hmm. being. And then when, and it's, we had status quo there for about five years. And then when we decided to take a look at Maple Avenue to uh, see whether or not we wanted to either redo the middle school where it stands or to build a new one, uh, there was adequate space there for another building. And the idea was raised, what about bringing the SAU building there uh, it would be much cheaper to build at the same time we're building a $30 million building next door. 
and there may be efficiencies. Uh, that's how we settled on building that wood chip plant that will fuel Daniel's uh, central office and the new middle school. Uh, so we felt there was a lot of um, sense in, in taking that to the voters. And at the same time the voters approved the middle school, they also approved building a new uh, SAU building for, uh, for central office staff. At which point, once we had the plans in hand and uh, our bonds out, we put it up for sale. And uh, John Harper <coughs> has uh, done an exceptional job of overseeing that process. We're now at the point in the transition where we have a qualified buyer, uh, we're negotiating a, a, sale, uh, a sale date, which was dependent upon funding by the new buyers and us getting our stuff out and organized in our new place. Uh, so at this point, we have a buyer both for the uh, central office building and also a buyer uh, and full deposit on the old middle school for about $1.3 million. So both of those buildings will go on to the tax rolls. I believe 34 West will go on as an office building complex, and the, new middle, the old middle school uh, will go on as some sort of a mixed use. But both will be on the tax rolls and producing uh, revenue for the city and school district. <coughs> So yeah, because we sold the middle school approximately 1.4 million, yep. and so at thirty dollars per thousand, they're going to get a tax bill pretty soon. Um, yeah, we're looking at a sale uh, early, uh, probably within the next month, uh, and and we love to do that as soon as possible, so that the revenues can go back to the taxpayers to help reduce taxes um, in the next uh, uh, tax cycle. Uh, we the committed the December bill, right? The December <laughs> bill that will hit. Uh, some of that money, and I forget exactly how much, uh, perhaps up to 500000 yeah, $500, will go into a capital reserve fund so we don't find ourselves in a similar <coughs> situation uh, that with our other buildings that there are capital improvements that need to be made and we delay them. Uh, so that 500000 will be a great next nest egg for future projects. The rest, after we pay the re realtor fees, will go back into the uh, <coughs> general fund and will be redu used to reduce the December tax bills. And when we talk about the real, they weren't your standard. They were a little bit lower. Right. And so the realtor is helping us out anyway. Yes. Uh, I, I thought it was a fair deal. And <coughs> Greg Johnson has done a tremendous job marketing the buildings and, uh, and I, has really served us well. And when you talk about the, the capital reserve fund, even my first two terms on the school, I just didn't understand why we didn't have that. On the the city council, yep. if we're going to buy a fire truck that we know six years from yep. now is going to cost $400,000, we don't wait until six years and just whack the bill yep. to the taxpayers. We're looking at capital reserves for all the yep. majors. And most of the school districts in SAU 29 have had capital reserves for several years. And so we, we knew the process and we knew it works and the benefit. It's also beneficial if uh, something unexpected happens. Uh, say a boiler goes at uh, the high school, something like that, you have a fund of money available that you can tap with voter uh, approval uh, to get that fix done immediately without having to cut into your operating budget. So it's just a really good budget planning tool. Yeah, because for a long time people thought capital reserves were slush funds. Yeah, and uh, you know people say they pay their taxes, and, th and they do, and that <laughs> when we've gone to the voters and said, uh, something is broken, we need to repair it. They've always been very supportive. Um, but if we can save some money now and hold on to it for a future project, uh, in some ways that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, because if you go to the voters right now and say, hey, the boiler went and it's going to cost $275,000, so we need an emergency session, or we're going to have to cut $275,000, right. maybe lay off three or four people. Yeah then they're going to go, why didn't you plan for it? Yep, and the voters <coughs> still have a say. Uh, public hearing would be needed to tap those funds, and uh, people have a right to get up and say, this isn't an appropriate use of that money. So there is a mechanism for public input um, before that money is used. Okay, September 6th. Yes. It's like being in Massachusetts. You don't go yeah. to... Well, we after to Labor Day. Wednesday after Labor Day. Yep. Some years it was early, some years it was late. And so you push back to September 6th just to ensure that the middle school would be ready? Well, I believe September 6th is Labor Day. So it would be, so, so be September, September 7th. 7th. And when we were looking at mm -hmm. our schedules and the bus schedules and all, uh, 
and also the, how the school year falls out into next June, um, I felt that we had a week's play in there and that um, it made no sense to me to have the middle school on one schedule and the high school and elementary on another. It's not fair to families that... Oh, they'd kill you. Uh, uh, <laughs> and they'd be right, you know, to arrange uh, vacations and child care and all of those things. And since we had a, a degree of uh, maneuverability on, on the June end, I felt pushing the date back for everyone uh, would be helpful. Um, and also we'll, we'll get a sense for what people feel, whether I remember as a kid and, and you growing mm -hmm. up in Fall River, I was in Medford, mm -hmm. that we never went back to school before, uh, before Labor Day. Uh, perhaps this is something the board will want to consider in future years. And the only, the only time I knew of people going back for, for Labor Day yep. when I was stationed in South Carolina and North Carolina, yep. and I'm going, it's 90 and 95 degrees at right. the middle of, and end of August. Why would you want to go to school with, in non-air conditioned buildings? Yes. <clears throat> so, so we're ready to go for the middle school. We, we should be. The, uh, I was over walking around today. It's an incredible building. Um, the, the last sections that, were, that are, uh, we're not dependent on uh, in order to open school, and that's the auditorium wing. Um, the, uh, the steel is up in that section. It's an incredible looking structure. Um, the roof, uh, the membrane roof has to go on, um, and then they'll come in and start putting in the interior. Uh, the gym floor went down on Friday, looks incredible. Uh, the uh, fitness and dance areas uh, were also done, those look great. Uh, they're putting the soundproofing into the, uh, the uh, practice areas for music. Uh, the art areas are done, courtyard is done, all the academic wing is done. And a fear that I had was that the, uh, the brains of the fire alarm system and communication systems wouldn't be ready. Uh, and they're doing the final testing on those now. Uh, so we should have a smooth entry um, into, into the school. We're planning for that first week of September before Labor Day, uh, we'll be conducting student and parent uh, tours through the building so the kids have a chance to have, get a feel for the building before, before we open. Uh, the, the, uh, the exterior areas are, are looking great. Uh, the track is down, looks great. Grass has all come up on the soccer field. Um, the irrigation system is working well. Uh, so that all those things that, it's, and it's just fun to see it all start to come together. <coughs> You've used the word great a bunch of times. You use the word incredible yep. a couple of times. Well, what happens if I'm a taxpayer yep. and I'm seeing what about good enough? What is, no, this great, this, you're, yep. you're wasting my money. What did some of the things that the architect do to ensure the building lasts longer and it's easier to, uh, cheaper to operate? Well, when we started, <coughs> I, um, the architect asked some general questions like, you know, what's the life expectancy of your building? And I said, 75 to 100 years is what I want you to build for. And, uh, and with the assumption that the end of 50 years, you'd have a major renovation of the uh, HVAC systems and electrical upgrades and, and that kind of thing. And then you'd get another 25 to 50 years out of the building. So starting off, the idea was use as long-lasting materials as possible. Uh, the, uh, we put the, the upgrades in the, in the safety and life cycle areas, the floors um, in areas that could have been tile, are uh, porcelain tile um, and uh, stone tile. They're going to last the the, uh, the length of the building. Uh, the uh, the roof is an expensive membrane roof that's w one piece that will uh, that will last a long time. The uh, we put it money into higher quality uh, HVAC equipment that will that will run long time. Having the uh, wood chip plant is a renewable energy source, but also very few moving parts. Uh, that should last the life of the project as well. Uh, the, the other expense we had was uh, bringing the building in compliance with uh, uh, the consortium for high performance buildings uh, so that there are going to be energy paybacks every single year in that building that uh, if we had gone with a big box, just wouldn't be there. And the type of insulation used, the windows are, uh, are a higher grade than, than would be. When you look at the structure, it, it looks like there's all these peaked roofs and very expensive. Uh, those roofs are designed to hide a lot of the apparatus 
on the uh, on the building. And they're also designed for the water that falls on those roofs to go down into the irrigation system, saving us money. Uh, last year, it cost us about ten thousand dollars to water the field behind the high school uh, because we use town city water there. Uh, the water that's going to be used um, on the irrigation system at the middle school is all generated on the land from rainfall. Like a perfect day like today. This is a great day because our irrigation system is Wouldn't have to up. pay the city a single penny. Not a penny. Um, and I think when people actually get into the building and start to look at the upgrades, uh, they're going to recognize that they've, this is more of an investment in the future uh, than a current day expense. We also didn't ignore the bottom line either. Uh, we, uh, through hard work by John Hopper and very clever timing of our bonding, uh, we saved $18 million over the course of our bonds. Uh, when we realized the uh, state of the construction economy, after the voters had approved the buildings, we decided not to bond the full amount that the voters gave us. Um, and so uh, we never bonded out the full amount that was given because we knew we wouldn't need it. Uh, so that we felt that by uh, taking our time, you know, timing the markets, we, we were ahead by, by $22 plus million plus right from the start. And uh, by doing, spending a little more money on the upgrades, uh, we got a much longer lasting project. Because most buildings are usually only built for 30 to 40 years. Right. And in New England, <coughs> uh, the average middle school costs well over $300 per square foot. Uh, this one's coming in at about $222 per square foot. So we're saving at a minimum $80 per square foot and putting in probably the highest quality uh, public building, public school building in the state at this time. And because of building aid, as when you wear your other hat you're familiar with, uh, it could be for many years to come. And, um, you know, looking back at it, you'd have to go and say, the voters of Keene were pretty smart by defeating the middle school the first time around because right. that was at the peak of the construction costs. Right, and, but also I hadn't developed a plan with enough <coughs> clarity and vision for people to get behind. Mm -hmm. And that's a lesson I learned the second time around uh, was to, to take our time and to, to really be able to express the vision for what we wanted to build. And the result was that 80%, 86% of the voters uh, agreed with the board and went ahead for the building. And that's incredible numbers. You've got to be able to sell it yes. or people are not going to buy. Yeah, if you don't have a clear vision for what you want to do and how it will benefit the students and the community, then uh, taxpayers are pretty savvy. If, if, if they don't believe you've got a clear plan and, uh, and you can articulate that, they're not going to go for it. So next time in the future, if we have to build a new elementary school or whatever, they, the taxpayers didn't vote the first time around right. for the middle, uh, the high school. Yep. They didn't vote the first time for the um, the middle school. They voted first time for the um, career center. Yes. So you got that, that was an <laughs> incredible deal too. <laughs> <coughs> timing, timing. Yep. And so, what about the construction in front of Maple Street? That's uh, that should be done in uh, pretty close to the opening of school. The uh, we had a lot of safety concerns naturally going from having, uh, you know, 150 kids at Daniels crossing Maple Avenue every day to having uh, seven or about 700 kids crossing every day um, is a huge risk. Uh, so that uh, we work with the city very carefully to develop a plan that will widen Maple Ave, allowing cars coming down that, uh, the exit ramp on the north side to pull right into the middle school uh, rather than having to go out into the flow of traffic. Um, sidewalks are being built that will not only enable kids to get to school safely, but will also help them getting up to the new Y when that, whenever <laughs> that opens. Uh, so that, uh, you know, the safety of the children was paramount. Uh, we've, because we were able to save some money in the overall project, we're putting some upgrades uh, into Maple Lab, like an island where children can, can move to and then, and then cross. Uh, we'll have uh, two crossing guards instead of one their mornings and afternoons. And, uh, and we're also doing some things that will hopefully slow traffic down a little bit. The, um, we've got about two minutes left. Yep. I'll put you really on the hot spot now. Okay. The part is 
we told, we didn't offer contracts, then we said we were going to offer contracts, then we changed it, then we came back. Right. And that was this year. Now, now we look at the state budget, we look at the federal budget, Yep. and now you're getting ready to do your budget. We've really <laughs> already started. August is when we start our preliminary look, and, uh, and it's nerve-wracking. Um, the fact that the New Hampshire budget is a two-year budget may give us a bit of a window. And the, the, in, the re most recent information coming back on the retirement suggests that we may have status quo for two years. Uh, but during that time, uh, we not only have to plan for next year, but we have to plan for a world in where there may be a constitutional amendment that removes mm -hmm. the obligation for the state to fund education for us. Uh, right now, that's over $10 million just for Keene. So if we were to lose that uh, out of a $60 million budget, uh, there's no way in good conscience I could recommend to the board that that $10 million uh, shortfall get put onto the taxpayers of Keene. Uh, their burden is great compared to most communities in the state already. So I think over this next budget is going to have us looking at really two budgets. The one for next year, uh, which may not ha have as many cuts as we first anticipated, but we have to plan ahead for that second year when there may be no state funding. And that's going to determine jobs um, and, uh, and, and improvements that may be coming forward uh, because of that funding cliff that has been pushed off a little but is still just as deep and wide <laughs> as before. Give you 30 seconds. The big change, tenure, three to five. Three to five. That's huge. Uh, it's, it's going to help us uh, working with uh, new teachers because we can look at a five-year plan to bring them to where we mm -hmm. want them to be. Uh, it adds much greater risk to the teacher. Uh, before, after your second year and you're, you do your, and you're still with us and you get through that third year and you walk in the building the first day of your fourth year, you've, you've got a continuing contract. Uh, now you've got two more years uh, to, uh, to be on those pins and needles. And that affects things for people with young families uh, you know, do I make a commitment? I buy a house in the community? Well, in five years, I'm going to know. That's, that's a long yep. time out in a young person's life. But I think overall, for us, it's an advantage in that it will give us more time to work with aspiring teachers to, to make them uh, professional teachers. The, um, well, I'll just correct you. It, you meant to say the third year, not the fourth year. Right. And the other part, real quick, is that that two, five years is only with the district. Yes. Which is quite different. Yep. So you could have five years and go someplace else and not be it. Right. So time went really quickly, and I enjoyed being here. It always here. does. It's Thank fun. you. And so hope to see you out there on the long road. Thank you.